on the time of day in your part of the world. And thank you for joining us uh, live and to those listening to the recording presentation afterwards. I'd like to warmly welcome our expert speakers, which we will introduce to you very shortly. However, before we begin, it's important to pause for a moment and state that we stand in solidarity with our colleagues and friends in the Ukraine, and we will do all we can at FIP to provide real and emotional support. And FIP has recently developed a guidance document to facilitate the inter 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 integration sorry, of the refugee pharmacy workforce from the Ukraine, which is available through the FIP website to members and will also be noted in the chat box as well. The FIP webinar today is titled Falsified Medicines and Misinformation on the Internet, Public Risk and Solutions. This is a very important area for patient safety and quality of care and an area of my own strong interest and activity for the past couple of decades. This program has been jointly produced by the Alliance for Safe Online Pharmacy, the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy and FIP. And now you can see my smiling face. My name is Ron Goos. I am the, a pharmacist and former regulator and assistant professor coming to you live from Canada. I'm also the past chair of the Canadian Patient Safety Institute and the past co-chair of Healthcare Excellence Canada. I'm currently a Canadian consultant with the DOT Pharmacy Program. And for the past 22 months, almost two years, uh, the chair of FIP's Regulators Forum. In today's webinar, we'll be having three presenters and they will describe the patient safety and risk components of online drug information and drug purchases. And the recent and ongoing iterations of the pandemic has made the issue much more important because more than ever, consumers are looking online for information, treatment, prevention products, vaccines, and medicines. Many of the consumers going online have never used the internet for these purposes previously. And it's important uh, that we have this program to educate others uh, to, in order to uh, make that a safe interaction with the internet. Because at any given time, there's roughly 95% of the online drug sailors that are actually operating illegally, violation of laws and placing consumers at risk. Drug purchases through illegal drug sellers on the internet might contain no drug, sub-therapeutic levels of a drug, or a completely different drug, or even at times toxic chemical, chemicals. They appear on the website as pharmacies or medical centers and would seem to provide credible healthcare information and drug information and safe and approved medications, but they are not doing so and present a major risk to the unknowing, unknowing consumer. Regulators throughout the world are monitoring the level of illegal drug sellers and medical clinics on the internet, regulatory solutions uh, to combat and remove the presence of these harmful vendors and sites are not being widely implemented and have been completely successful. So public awareness is an important step, but also raising the awareness among healthcare providers, lawmakers, and social media platforms are very important activities as well. We have three speakers just waiting to enlighten you about this issue and provide you encouragement and information to get active uh, to remove these illegal drug sellers from the internet and greatly reduce the risk of to the unknowing patients throughout the world. But before we get on with the presentations, I just have some announcements I wish to bring to your attention and you'll see them on the screen. Please note that this event will be recorded and is being recorded and live stream on FIP YouTube channel and will be available at the FIP website using the address events.fip.org. Certificates of attendance will be issued by FIP. We always get that question in the chat. Yes, absolutely. They will issue certificates of attendance, all those who are attending live, but also if you join uh, into the meeting uh, to watch it as a video, they will issue a certificate at that point as well. So to those listening live, please feel free to send your questions to the uh, Q&A box provided, by, uh, provided on this uh, presentation and the FIP staff uh, online and I will do our best to manage your input and get answers to those questions. So please 
uh, we use the chat, but for the questions, if you can put that in the Q&A box and it'll highlight it and we have a better chance of finding those questions and bring them on to our presenters. And if you currently are not an FIP member, please take a moment after the webinar to join. FIP membership is immense value. The membership benefits include an invaluable resource, networking, timely events, webinars such as these. And I can tell you from my uh, experience, an FIP membership has increased my knowledge and proven very useful in the performance of my duties. And of course, FIP is, a, is the global body uh, pharmacy representing over 4 million pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists. If you are a pharmacist and pharm or pharmaceutical scientist and would like to become an FIP member, please join at FIP's website at www.fip.org. Okay, as I've already advised you, we have three expert presenters on the issue of falsified medicines and misinformation on the internet. Mike Isles, Justin Macy, and Libby, Benny, Libby Bainey sorry, are internationally recognized for their work in this area and will assist us in learning more about this issue and the public risks and solutions. As they come to the microphone I'll do their, to do their presentation, I'll do a better introduction of those individuals in more detail. For now, we have the program list on how we will proceed. And there's the, the order of the presenters. It's pretty straightforward. The most important part of this webinar, in my opinion, uh, apart from the information that we'll, presenters will provide, is absolutely your questions and comments. And we look forward to seeing that um, in the question and answer box. And we will direct those to the speakers. If you want to direct your question to a particular speaker, you can also put that in the Q&A box. And at the end of the presentations, we will get to those questions and get you some answers. Happy to also have your comments. And if you want the speakers to reflect on those comments, please put that in the Q&A box as well. We'll learn so much from the presenters, but the dialogue and the questions will also give us an opportunity to learn from your uh, thoughts and uh, questions. So please remember to put your questions in the Q&A box. Our learning objectives for this uh, presentation are pretty straightforward. They're there for you to um, see. We certainly want to identify the level of legal, legal online drug sailors and the bogus medical clinics on the internet and the impact on the unsuspecting public. We'll be able to identify the barriers to overcome and better protect the public. We also will be able to identify programs and initiatives currently in place to combat misinformation and poor virtual care, falsified medication and falsified medication in order to enhance the safety and protection of the public and the internet consumer, and obviously to encourage and support standards for virtual care. Okay, my tongue's getting a little bit tied and it's enough of my ramblings. Now we wanna to get to the important part and the uh, information part of the sessions and our first speaker is getting queued up. Our first speaker is Mike Isles. Mike is the executive director for the Alliance of Safe Online Pharmacy in the European Union. ASOP EU's mission is to enable patients to buy their medications safely online, where it's legal to do so. ASOP EU collaborates strongly with ASOP Global and its members and observers include many of the key internet, internet stakeholders. Its aim is to facilitate and campaign for new legislation, as well as concrete uh, voluntary actions that will make a real difference and ultimately benefit the health and safety of patients. Mike is also the executive director of the European Alliance for Access to Safe Medications, sorry, Safe Medicines, a pan-European nonprofit patient safety organization. This alliance advocates for the development of a robust and harmonized European Union regulatory framework to protect patients and guarantee the safety, quality, and efficacy of innovative nanomedicines and nanosimilars. It also campaigns for safer use of unlicensed off-label medicines and the adoption of medical, pharmacy, and nursing practices that aim to eradicate medication errors the better harmonization of compounding practices and the inclusion, sorry, the exclusion of falsified and substandard medicines from the supply chain. Mike and I have worked and collaborated together uh, over the last several years. And I can tell you, we're very fortunate to have him lead our webinar, lead off our webinar today. So Mike, we see you, turn that mic on and over to you, my friend. 
Well, thank you very much indeed, Ron, um, and thank you, FIP team, uh, Mila and Ruben, and all those involved in this uh, important webinar. Uh, it's a real honour to have the opportunity to address uh, so many people around the world. I've just been having a look in the, in the chat, and it's Argentina, it's Rwanda, it's Japan, it's Philippines, it's so many countries. So I, I can assure you it's a real honour to be able to uh, outreach to you and impart a little bit of knowledge which I hope is absolutely fundamental to you being able to do things in your country that will make a difference to get better governance of the internet to protect your patients um, which you um, uh, deal with. My talk is going to concentrate, uh, let me just go forwards, I beg your pardon. My, my talk is going to concentrate on demonstrating the problem. Uh, and how the pandemic has in fact uh, enabled everybody for greater and greater use of the internet. We have only to think perhaps about our own behaviours with the internet and how we have probably enhanced, increased our use of the internet to procure goods and services. Um, so what is the extent of the problem? There is most definitely a rising tide of criminal activity to manufacture falsified counterfeit or put simply fake medicines. The exact monetary size of the problem is not known. But we are talking of a highly profitable market of billions. Now, depending on the world region, infiltration into the legitimate supply chain, so from manufacturer to wholesaler to pharmacy, then that's the legitimate supply chain. And of course, the illegitimate supply chain, and we call it that because we regard the conduit of the internet as providing a, a conduit for illegitimate activity, it varies greatly across the world. However, what is certain is that the direction of travel by governments and regulatory agents is to develop supply chains that allow access to the World Wide Web. This is a startling fact, a simple statistic, but a truly frightening one. And whilst the level of knowledge by consumers and patients is most certainly improving, we are up against highly sophisticated, well-funded criminal gangs and networks. With the click of a mouse, a potentially illegal and harmful medicine can be ordered online, often unwittingly. And yes, also sometimes people know what they're doing and they are prepared to take a risk, even though the medicine might contain too much active ingredient, too little, or no active ingredient at all, or in some cases, poison. This was ASOP EU's estimate of the number of people buying medicines online in Europe. Yes, it's an older market research uh, study, 2014, so we can confidently predict that this number will now be far greater so all countries around the world, fueled by a tsunami of criminal activity, catalyzed by the pandemic, face a major healthcare challenge. This slide was created by ASOP Global, and again, it demonstrates some disturbing statistics. The first line talks about an explosion of cybercrime. Now, during March 2020, at least 100,000 domain names were registered containing terms like COVID, Corona and virus. And the third bullet point is equally telling. Domain names using similar terms are running at around 1,000 per day. This is what we are up against. Now, the internet is complex. It's a complex beast comprising many players that enable it to function. To name just a few, we have registries who operate country code top level domains like .com. 
like .co.uk, like .r.fr for France, .de for Germany, .cl for Chile, .cn for China, and quite rightly, Antarctica gets its own country code TLD .aq. But they're just a few. If you translate that to all of the countries in the world and add on .nets, .orgs, etc., and the top level domain names .pharmacy, .paris, .london, you can see it's a very complex environment. And of course, we have search engines, we have social media, we have online marketplaces or platforms. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. And one soon realizes that better governance of the internet requires not one silver bullet, but many. Now, onto some super work that has helped greatly to define the issue. This, is, this report, which ASOP contributed to, is a must read and was compiled by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, better known as the OECD, and also the European Union Intellectual Property Office Observatory, known as EUIPO Observatory, of which ASOP are civil society members. This is a 94-page report published in March 2020 and it revealed key statistics and modus operandi of this market. Value of counterfeit pharmaceuticals estimated at up to 4.4 million uh, billion US dollars. Antibiotics, lifestyle and painkiller medicines were the most commonly transacted, but it's very important to note that countless studies and seizures by law enforcement at customs posts uh, uh, have collected all sorts of medicines. So it's cardiovascular, it's anti-cancer, it's CNS, it's allergy. Even vaccines are available to be bought online. And it's interesting to note that the criminals are now using small packages by post. This makes it, makes it much more difficult to trace the source. And not surprisingly, they mark India and China as identified as the, la as the largest producers. So here's a little bit more detail on what is a rogue pharmacy network. First point to note is that these networks are organized by all, with all of the funding they need and know-how that that brings. They are complex networks and they are global. Website templates are created that can be easily swapped. So taking down one website usually means it will pop again, up again in a different disguise, a different guise looking pretty similar. Affiliate marketeers operate the websites and they drive traffic to these websites and in doing so, they take a small profit. Interestingly, they typically sell prescription only medicines without requiring a prescription. So if there was one clear message we could all adopt is to raise awareness that a website selling a prescription medicine that doesn't require a prescription is most likely operating illegally. The last point here, and if there's a chance in the questions I'll elaborate it on it, think of the supply chain the simplicity of the internet, say versus hard drugs. And that's why there is an opportunity to make 10 times the profit uh, compared to hard drugs. This report by Europol is enlightening, enlightening in that it describes how the pandemic, how the pandemic brought about a rise in crime and criminals capitalized on the opportunity to dupe the public into buying products not fit for purpose. And just one quote from their nine findings, the online and offline distribution of counterfeit and substandard personal protective equipment, pharmaceutical and sanitary products, including fake Corona home test kits and alleged vaccines preventing COVID-19 infection remains a consistent pandemic related criminal activity. So even today, we all need to be aware that criminals will still be using this method to dupe the unsuspecting
public. Of course, criminals don't just use more traditional web-based website. Increasingly, they are penetrating the social media platforms. However, it is a fact that if you decide to buy something from a social media platform, it will ultimately need a domain name to transact the business. A recent study conducted by the EU IPO Observatory concluded that 11% of conversations, and this was from a sample of 3.9 million conversations tracked in this research study regarding physical products, they were possibly related to counterfeits and 35% related to piracy. So we're talking about video, film, uh, literature content. And it is interesting to think about the Elon Musk situation where he has decided potentially not to acquire Twitter due to reported lack of knowledge about accounts. It's a complex environment. Here is another study by Europol on the rise of viral marketing, the pandemic so directly related to, so it's directly related to social media. And you can see here the significant rise in tweets in February 2019 from around 2000 going up to nearly 9,000 by the end of March. Uh, these are tweets directly related to COVID-19 counterfeit goods. I quote from the report, counterfeiting of pharmaceutical products has been one of the most insidious forms of profiteering during a global pandemic. Counterfeiters have seized the opportunity to exploit the demand for drugs offering potential as treatment of options in fighting COVID-19. Now I must quickly comment on this excellent National Association of Boards of Pharmacy report. Another must read in my opinion. The third stab point down I think is a key point. Over 90% of COVID related domains identified were registered anonymously, which makes it difficult for law enforcement to investigate these sources. I'm not going to dwell on this slide, as I'm sure you are very familiar with those medicines that have gained significant media attention. But it is a fact that chloroquine, hydrochloroquine used to treat malaria, and the macrolide antibiotic azithromycin and the antiretrovirals lopinavir and retinavir and also um, the antihypertensive diltiazem and the diuretic furuzamide and the antimalarial mefloquine have been touted and peddled as potential cures. Justin, the second speaker after me, is going to go into much more detail here. But I wanted to stress that leaders of governments can play a key part in how populations absorb and accept so-called facts. Similarly, in the EU, we have had leaders whose scientific grounding has not been perfect. I believe it's important for all of us to be aware of this international treaty, the Medicrime Convention. Under this convention, which entered into force in January 2016, intentionally manufacturing, supplying, offering to supply and trafficking of falsified medicines is, is considered a criminal act. The treaty calls for multilateral collaboration across nations, disciplines and sectors. Currently, 21 countries have ratified this convention, 14 in the Council of Europe, and seven non-member states, Belarus, Benin, Burkina Faso, Guinea, Morocco, Niger, and the Russian Federation. Clearly, the Ukraine war is currently causing issues that is holding up the initiative. But ASOP EU, as an official observer, can strongly suggest areas for development. And we have asked for the principles of dot pharmacy, which the next speaker will cover, and also longitudinal market research in these countries will be highly beneficial and we hope to push through, push through those initiatives. I would like to mention quickly this four minute film 
produced by the Foundation Chirac movement. It's a powerful video, video depicting three families that bought online and received falsified medicines and suffered dire consequences. It takes us behind the scenes and shows how the criminals manage the manufacture and distribution of falsified medicines. The link to the YouTube video is on the slide and it, was, it will also be posted in the chat. Do spend four minutes viewing it. I conclude with this slide some take home messages. There is no one silver bullet. We must all work together to tackle this issue. We must raise awareness among the populations of our country. A website selling a medicine that does not require a prescription will most likely be operating illegally. And paradoxically, the pandemic has alerted governments throughout the world to the issue of falsified medicines and other healthcare products. Please use your influence in your country and capitalise on that fact. National pharmacy associations, whether they be community or hospital, have tremendous influence and can influence governmental initiatives in your country. Push for best practices by your internet country code top level domain registry and advocate for more internet governance within your country. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate that. And uh, you said at the outside you're going to demonstrate the, the breadth of the problem. You certainly have done that. So thank you. It's a worldwide problem. And it's amazing to realize the number of illegal businesses operating on the internet and posing that phenomenal risk to the unsuspecting consumer. Uh, you've quite, very, quite uh, adequately done the definition of or describing the problem in, from the ease perspective but also from uh, various spots throughout the world. And uh, I said earlier, the learning that we are going to have from the speakers is clearly most important uh, and very important, but also the comments in the chat line and the Q&A. Uh, we already had a great comment in the chat around using the term pharmacy. And I think it's a point uh, to, to raise with you now. We often, uh, workers in this area may refer to someplace as a pharmacy, when in fact it's really not a licensed pharmacy, it is more of an online drug seller. And uh, we do sometimes uh, interchange the terms and it can be confusing, but clearly the ones that are operating illegal are not pharmacies, they're in fact uh, those online drug sellers that, sellers that uh, put the patients at risk. So let's move on to our next speaker. Uh, you have on your screen, uh, Justin. And Justin Macy, leads NABP's digital healthcare team, which both verifies legitimate pharmacy community members and conducts research on illegal actors. And uh, Justin will do a great job in working with the terms between pharmacy and illegal drug act, legal drug sellers on the internet. Justin specializes in the intersection of law, technology and healthcare with a focus on pharmacy practice and drug regulations. He speaks frequently on topics related to the online sale of medicines. Prior to joining NABP in the United States, Justin was a specialist in Amazon's consumer legal department and associate director of innovation at LegitScript. Justin is a valued colleague of mine and his knowledge on how illegal online businesses operate and work uh, uh, is amazing. He and his team do an amazing job to identify the harmful sites. Uh, the research and abilities to identify those sites is very impressive. And for someone who's not very familiar with all the technology, he manages it so well. And when he explains it to guys like me, he makes it seem very, very simple. So we're looking forward to hearing from Justin. We'll look to see your smiling face and uh, please turn your mic on. And here we go, Justin, thank you. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good night. Thank you for having me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, please feel free to keep the uh, Q&A going. I do best when I'm responding to questions, so it helps me. Uh, so greatly appreciated. Let me start off by kind of posing, you know, is this problem a new problem? Uh, and I kind of try to use this comically old version of Gmail here to demonstrate that it's not new. Uh, 
people have been trying to sell drugs online for a very long time. Uh, I believe we started accrediting um, legitimate online pharmacies in 1999 as a result of kind of spam marketing messages like the ones you see here. So this isn't a new problem. Uh, the the drugs or some of the content may change, but ultimately the backend infrastructure that either underpins the these criminal enterprises or you know the, the the problems that we face in enforcement aren't aren't particularly new or unusual. They're they're somewhat of a, a mainstays. And as Mike set up uh, on the last slide, we have some basic facts about why we're here today. You know. Between 30 and 35,000 illegal online pharmacies, that ends up being roughly 20 new ones every single day. Uh, the drugs sold by these illegal online pharmacies are substandard and often falsified, uh, or, or could be uh, merely unregistered or unlicensed in the jurisdictions for which they're targeting. But and most, and maybe most importantly here, and most pertinent to this call today specifically, is that even when we take an illegal website and we show it to a, a trained and licensed pharmacist, at least in the U.S. where this the study was done. Uh, you know, one, one out of five can't find, uh, can't determine, uh, believe affirmatively that the website is operating legally. Um, and so the we'll, we'll get to the consumer trends when when Libby speaks after me. But the reality is, people just don't know. As far as the work that NAAP does us on the bad guy side, I'm going to start there. Uh, we populate something called NAP's not recommended list. Uh, we've identified over 37,000 domain names. Uh, many of those are offline right now. Probably about a third of them are current and active. Uh, and we find those at about 200 new websites per week. Uh, th that's not because that's all we could find. That's because we had this is a pro bono activity that we dedicate resources towards for public safety reasons. If we doubled the, the staffing on it, I have no doubt we would double the number we found per week. Um, of those that are on the not recommended list, 95% of them have been documented to historically not require a valid prescription. Uh, I will flag the not recommended list is US centric uh, for this call specifically. That doesn't mean that the websites on it are operating legally in other jurisdictions. Uh, it just isn't the analysis that's been used to place a domain name onto the not recommended list one way or the other. The vast majority of the websites on the not recommended list do ship globally or at least semi-globally. So probably still pertinent in most jurisdictions, uh, but I just want to flag that at the onset. And so you'll, that's why you'll see like in this next bullet, the 86% of the websites on the not recommended list offer or facilitate the offering of medications that are not authorized in the US. Uh, then lastly here, 54% uh, of the websites based on, based on our last statistics, statistics uh, dispense or offer to facilitate the dispensing of controlled substances. Now, in different jurisdictions, those have different words. So that might be drugs of misuse, drugs of abuse, dangerous drugs. It depends on your, your local legislation. But generally speaking, there's a great amount of uniformity around those due to the treaties on narcotics and the treaties on psychotropic drugs. So we populate this list, and it's actually used. So in the US, if you go to Bing search engine at least, and are, are looking in this case, it was for our online pharmacy cheap meds. Uh, if you find one of the websites that are on the list and it shows up, you'll actually see a warning here that says that this site's not, uh, this, this site is on NAAP's not recommended list. And you can go to the FDA for more information in general. So we have seen some level of enforcement and participation that has helped. So next I wanna talk about what does it take to get on this illustrious list? What, what do you have? What exactly? What kind of terrible things do you have to do to be placed on the not recommended list? And as pharmacists, I think all of these will, will find them appalling in our own unique way. Um, so, let me start by saying that facilitating the sale of prescription only medication without requiring prescription. We use the word facilitate because it could mean directly selling yourself, or the primary purpose of the website being utilized to facilitate the sale through other websites, and we'll get to exactly how affiliate marketers work and why they may not be directly the seller themselves, but still get placed on the non-recommended list. Um, but, but either way, yes, uh, pre prescription-only medicine should require a valid prescription, as Mike mentioned in the last, last deck. Uh, if, if they didn't, then I think we would all, you know, kind of appreciate that it, our, our role in checking those prescriptions probably is somewhat meaningless. Uh, and I think that we provide significant amount of value to our healthcare system. 
the practice of pharmacy without required licensure in all relevant jurisdictions. Uh, I think we all can appreciate that our, our licenses as pharmacists are not super portable. Uh, it is not a scenario where we can easily go from one country to another country without demonstrating our, our knowledge, demonstrating our compliance with the laws in those jurisdictions. Same thing is true of any, any kind of pharmacy shipping into another country. Uh, it's required in order for uh, the regulators of those patients that are, that are receiving those medications to have licensure in order to have sufficient inspections and things like that. And lastly here, facilitating the medicine that's not been approved or authorized in the sale of patients jurisdictions. I think we can all appreciate that we want our drugs to work and we wanna have great assurances that our drugs are effective. Um, pretty straightforward things. They're pretty egregious things. We call them the big three. Most websites that are placed on the not recommended list violate all three of them. So I wanna take some time here and actually go through and walk through some illegal websites as, as a case study. I think that uh, it's easy for us to talk about them at a high level, but, but when you start actually seeing them, it's, there's a difference between being told and seeing it with your own eyes. So I'm gonna spend some time on this. First, I'm gonna look at the domain name here. It's cheapshopmed.com. Not typically how we refer to pharmacies uh, or they refer to themselves. Um, and then if we move over to that blue box on the right here, you'll see that it has a cart and then it curiously says bonus two. And you might be wondering, what does that mean? Well, this website sells two bonus sildenafil tablets with whatever order you place for whatever prescription drugs you buy. Um, that is not a common behavior for pharmacies. Uh, we rarely give away free prescription drugs that are not prescribed for a patient. Um, but you'll see that this is actually a somewhat common sales tactic that occurs with these illegal online pharmacies. Um, next, I want to jump over to the left-hand side where you can see the category list of different drugs that are offered here. This includes medications, uh, you know, antibiotics, arthritis medication, but somewhat curiously here, comparatively to what I last said, it also includes blood pressure medicines. So yes, you could come in, put nitro in your cart, go to the checkout and be offered uh, sildenafil as well for free as, as your bonus pills. Now, turning to the middle of the page here, you'll see that there's a collection of logos to demonstrate you know, known brands that a consumer may be familiar with. Visa, MasterCard, uh, you know, the illustrious Diners Club card. Uh, these are FedEx, you know, UPS, Royal Mail. These are all intended to, to give the patient a, a feeling that, that this website is legitimate. And it has full, full customer service features. If you look at the top, there's a live chat online. There's a testimonials page you can get to. Uh, you can check the status of your order. We're going to talk about their frequently asked questions in a second, so I'm going to skip that for now. Then if we turn to the, the, the substance of the page, when we actually start looking at you know, the meat and potatoes of what they're selling on this page itself, uh, you can see the blue box here is around Viagra Superactive. That is not a, a known brand to me uh, as far as the approval of Viagra goes. I've never seen any official super active Viagra, just, just regular Viagra. Um, uh, on the left-hand side there of that, you'll see another product labeled Viagra. Um, curious that, that it, it could be, uh, you know, it's distinctly different from the brand Viagra, which is immediately to the right. This is non-brand Viagra seemingly. Uh, and you'll also notice that the strengths that's come in, these are not strengths that are commercially made um, as either a generic or an approved medication, at least in the U.S. And if we go all, and uh, I'll also highlight that all of these are allegedly FDA approved by this gray watermark, where the reality is that uh, the only one that's possibly FDA approved would be that quote unquote brand Viagra that is in the, the third over from, from your left. Um, and then lastly, I wanna turn over to all the way to the right, you see Viagra Professional. Uh, again, not a drug that is at least approved in the US. I, this is Viagra Professional. I hate to see what Viagra Amateur looks like. So next I wanna turn over to the frequently asked questions of the same site. And this, is, this was a live site when taken. This isn't something special. I'm gonna show you a couple different examples and we're gonna demonstrate this is, this is somewhat common. You're gonna recognize some of these things. But when you go to the frequently asked questions, there are, there are you know, meaningful questions that clearly demonstrate the illegality of their practice. So do you require a prescription before purchasing your, on your site? Notice that we do not require any prescription for anything you can order on our site. We strongly recommend you consult your doctor before ordering anything from us. 
And lastly, at the bottom here, you see, do you ship internationally? We ship to most worldwide countries. Please contact our customer service or check order uh, form to find out the available delivery op options in your region. A couple of interesting bits here. Uh, first of all, I think it's it's difficult uh, as, you know, in, at least in the US in order to ship between different states, you have to be licensed in each state. So a pharmacy operating legally across all of the US would theoretically have to have upwards of 50 licenses at a minimum. Uh, it's, I, I don't know of any pharmacies that can have all the licenses required to operate worldwide. Uh, that seems like a, a tall order and likely, if not completely impossible. Um, the other thing I'll add here is that most worldwide countries, the word most there is actually doing a, a decent amount of lifting. Because these international criminal syndicates are, are targeting specific jurisdictions or are located in different jurisdictions, they intentionally don't offer services in all of the jurisdictions not uncommon to you know criminal enterprises they don't like to pee in their own pool uh so often you will find that these criminal enterprises will not offer services in places where they're physically located to avoid getting nabbed by local law enforcement they'd rather create a intergovernmental problem of, of jurisdiction between two different countries than than risk being nabbed kind of at home Next, I want to show you another example here. Uh, this, I believe, was covered in the COVID report that Mike uh, Mike highlighted that we put together. Um, it's it's a great report. I highlight. I recommend reading it as well as our other RogarX report uh, in general. Um, this website, ivermectinmeds.com, obviously trying to join the bandwagon of uh, alleged COVID treatments here. Uh, this website, very similar to the website we saw before, right? Uh, it has bonus. Uh, pills for every order in the top right there. Um, you can see on the uh, left-hand side, a collection of different drugs that uh, including antibiotics, antifungals, erectile dysfunction medication. This website selling stromectal uh, in general, uh, presumably to take advantage of the, the fever around uh, it as a potential COVID treatment. But what I want to talk about with this site most importantly is that Although it says at the top, Trust Pharmacy, World Famous Pharmacy, I think most people would not consider this World Famous Pharmacy. It is for me, because this is a commonly used template. So common, in fact, that it's, it's very, very easy for us to find many, many, many of these websites that have the same image. These are all different websites. They're all different domain names, but they all are utilizing the same fundamental template. In fact, when we take the phone number off this website and look through our database of, of of illegal actors that are that are utilizing uh, through our not recommended list and, and the things we store there, we find over over a thousand uh, phone numbers easy, over a thousand websites easily share the same phone number, if not more. Um, interestingly, if you're looking to save money, I, I believe these were all taken at the same time. A few of these, if you look at the buy now uh, only offer, a couple of them are a little bit cheaper. So maybe there's some games to be played there as far as the marketing goes. But generally speaking, they're going to be nearly identical in all of the content. So Mike touched on uh, the pharmacy affiliate networks and how they operate. I want to double down on it and go into a little more detail. So again, you have to think about these logically as a business unit. They are designed to profit. They are designed to make money. Um, they Just like any other business, they have infrastructure, they have setup, they have different parties involved. Uh, it's not uncommon to have a single uh, operator organization in one location being kind of the quote unquote mastermind or the tech behind it, and then have call, call uh, source facility or call center facilities, have drop shipment facilities they work with, have banking accounts and banking partners that, that uh, facilitate transactions in other, other jurisdictions. And lastly, and probably most importantly for their ability to scale is this concept of affiliate marketing or the affiliate network. This is the person who makes that commission that Mike talked about, that, that person who creates or uses you know, SEO or email spam to propagate and, and proliferate those websites in the, that I just flagged before that are all similar but using different domain names. That's that, that endpoint that allows them to scale. So what I want to do here, and I think it, it could be you know, interesting, is to, to try becoming an affiliate marketer, uh, to, just to see what this looks like. Because uh, you've all seen 
posts in comments on blogs or in newspaper articles at the bottom that say, hey, you can earn you know, $25 an hour sitting in your PJs at home from your computer. And, and the question is, how, how does that work? And the answer is affiliating marketing systems are that. They're not all necessarily for pharmaceuticals, right? Amazon has a very robust affiliate marketing system, but sometimes they are. And when they are, it's usually a bad situation. So if I search pharma affiliate advertising, and this is a little dated, it's from uh, 2019, but I think, I think the information here is still relevant. I don't think COVID changed any of this. Uh, if I get, get this, I can kind of go through. The first one there is an ad, and then I see some other ones. I can see down here at the bottom, top eight online pharmacy affiliate programs. I click on that link. I end up on a blog. I've hidden the names and the, the identity here uh, poorly in order to spare the guilty. Um, but it explains, this post will help you get the complete information on the top online pharmacy affiliate programs for 2019 for earning high commissions. You can join these affiliate programs and make a good source of income. So there's a list here. There's eight of them on it. The first couple were actually supplement supplements, not actually drugs. Um, doesn't mean they're, they're good necessarily, but different levels of regulatory scrutiny. The third one here, though, is the RX affiliate network, which stood out to me because I'm familiar with this network. Uh, if you read through here, which I won't do uh, currently, but if you read through here, you'll notice that it likely isn't written by an English uh, English speaking native, which is entirely okay. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. I have a problem with the substantively the content and, and selling prescription only drugs without a prescription. But you'll see that they're charging corporations set in Japanese Europe um, as that that kind of line in the middle, the end of the first paragraph, just not entirely um, not entirely on board there. We zoom in and look a little more detail here. You can see that they're selling controlled medicines. Again, controlled medicines referring to, depending on your jurisdiction, drugs of abuse, drugs of misuse, uh, dangerous drugs. It all, again, totally depending. It's typically things that include opioids. They also sell non-controlled substances. They give you commission. And here you see, look, it's 30% commission. Um, I don't know how many of you are pharmacists that are working in a retail setting. I think the vast majority of pharmacies don't receive 30% commission on the sale of any, any medication, uh, at least not in the US, uh, let alone have the ability to give 30% of that, the money that they receive for a drug out to someone else for marketing, merely marketing the product. That's just not the way kind of the industry works, at least again in the US. So I, from here, you can click the link and you can register and sign up. You can become a partner right here on the right-hand side. Uh, if you go ahead and go through that process, there may be some, some checks to make sure that you are not you know, a police officer or law enforcement or the like, but you can get through and become an affiliate marketer. And that's it, that you, you profit, you're done. Congratulations, uh, you have perpetuated an illegal criminal syndicate. So now what I wanna do here is show you a little bit more about how this, this network specifically operates. Uh, and so I've taken this rxaffiliatenetwork.cc domain name, this image over here on the right-hand side, and I've used some uh, cyber sleuthing tools. I'm not going to get into the, the nuance and details of it, but if, for those of you who care, I did a simple reverse name server query, which essentially lets me see websites that utilize some of the same backend servers um, that allow the domain name to, to work. And so as number 14 here, you can see our ex affiliate network. That is the domain name we were just looking at. That is the criminal network that we could sign up and join. You'll notice here there are 18 uh, domain names on this name server, which means it's highly likely that they are co-owned or affiliated in some way. Um, you could find a name server and have hundreds or thousands on it. That's a public name server. It's not going to be indicative of common ownership or control. That's not the case here. And then when we look at these domain names, just from the onset, you can kind of get a clear picture of what's going on. 24-7 RxPill, BitcoinRx.co. Um, if I skip down a little bit, you see LifestyleDrugstore.co, LifestyleDrugstore.in. Uh, skip down a little bit more. You have MedStore Online, different different domain name uh, TLDs there. CXIN Pro. You go down, you see that RX Affiliate Network.cc. That's the original uh, website that we saw. You have Secure Payment Cart.cc. That's likely how they transact in the, the their payments. And then you have SPCAdmin.com. That's likely Secure Payment Cart Admin account. That's where they can go in and and set up the the payment cart for different websites. Then you have Stay Hard Forever and whatever the last one there is. 
But generally speaking, you, you can already look at this and see there's a common thread between them. But let's look at these one, the, the two in the blue box up here, Bitcoin RX and Lifestyle Drugstore. So if I come up here to uh, Bitcoin RX, that's BTC Pharmacy is the one. You can see that it sells controlled substances again, uh, tramadol, various strengths, various countries of origin, uh, not necessarily all strengths that are, uh, that are approved in the same way. Um, collection of drugs here, all of which you can buy without a prescription, schizophrenia, sleep insomnia, weight loss. And then you have a full worldwide, you know, full-fledged customer service operation. So you have all the different forms of contacts you can use. You have a live chat feature here. Um, you know, it, it's designed to sell drugs. It's, it's designed to be a business. That's how you have to think about it. So if I flip to that next page, Lifestyle Drugstore, looks different, right? Still accepts Bitcoin down here. Uh, the, the front of the page looks different. It's a completely different template. But what I think is important to notice here, and the reason I call this out, is the phone numbers are the same, right? And this is, this is how we network some of these websites. We use the unique identifiers to connect the dots between these networks. And this is a real-life example of a network that did, that did exist. It was targeting customers in the US. It was allegedly Canadian, uh, but the only thing Canadian about it was the maple leaf on their, their website. Uh, the the back end kind of uh, mastermind behind it was located in Russia. They utilized servers in Brazil and China. Uh, they had bank accounts in Azerbaijan, and their fulfillment uh, drop shipper was coming out of India. So some solutions that we have and some work that we can do. And, and Libby is going to get into some, some specific regulations and legislation that we're supporting and, and working through Congress in the U.S. But these are things that, that don't require an active or a government agency or, require, or can utilize existing tools. So we have the not recommended list that we mentioned before. We share that with agencies and stakeholders. There's a couple here that aren't included, but FDA, DEA, Europol, um, I think recently we started sharing it with Western Union as well. Collection of organizations uh, get this information from us. Likewise, this information is totally publicly available. So um, if a user comes to our website and searches and, and checks a specific domain name, it will tell them whether or not it's on the not recommended list. Next, we publish rogue activity reports. These reports focus on a current topic. For example, the COVID-19 report that Mike uh, Mike made mention of. We have a report previously on opioids. We've got some so one, some older ones on social media, and there will be a new one in the future, uh, not not too distant future, that talks specifically about the effectiveness of locking and suspending domain names to shut down rogue networks like these. And then, lastly, we assess regulators. Uh, that's helping them uh, kind of figure out where to turn to for issues like this. You can imagine at the you know at the individual state level in the U.S. This is a uh, there isn't a good way to enforce this cross-border border issue. So providing information there. Likewise, we get outreach from journalists asking for information about this because some current event that often occurs or covering the road RX activity reports that we put out. So being pharmacists, I, I always want to kind of provide uh, clinical pearls here. These are things that can be taken away to protect patients today. Um, the first is... Uh, Anyone can share information with NAEP. You could do so anonymously. You could do so um, directly. Uh, we have a link on our website to report sites. We get sites from that. It's not the most, not the majority of the sites we get. The majority is kind of from our own acting as consumers and, and using consumer tools to kind of go out and find these illegal actors. But we absolutely take those that information. And when we get that information, a human being goes through and reviews it to make sure that it meets the criteria for our not recommended list. Um, we direct patients to safe.pharmacy. Safe.pharmacy is, uh, is our patient-centric page. This is where you can come and use the search bar that you see on that right-hand side. That search bar not only shows the illegal actors or actors that are facilitating, uh, facilitating illegal activity, it also shows uh, websites that are accredited by NAAP. And from there, I wanna jump to that briefly. Uh, so we have an accreditation program. We own .pharmacy. So when you think about uh, .co.uk, .com, .net, 
Um, in order to get a dot pharmacy domain name, you have to go through us. Uh, so we know that it's verifiable. You can trust it. You can't get it from some other means. And we actually use dot pharmacy as the seal for accrediting these websites that come through our program. Uh, we do this because logos and seals can be easily fake. Um, instead, the seal is literally in the URL. It is impossible to, to duplicate. There can only be one of them. Uh, you can't kind of go through and put another one in there or similar to it. It just doesn't work. Um, and then it's really easy for consumers to spot a legitimate pharmacy. Now, what I will say is we haven't uh, been able to drive consumer demand or patient demand to demand people use dot .pharmacy domain names. And dot .pharmacy domain name, by the way, is a global standard. We review websites uh, all over the, the world. I will say that about 75% of them are in the US. We have a, a little less than 60%. Uh, we believe by, based on some you know, back of the napkin math, 60% um, of the the pharmacies in the US are accredited, about 37% um, are accredited in Canada, from Canada. And then that accreditation, as I said before, is, is lacking some consumer uh, aspects to it, but it does, uh, it is recognized by a collection of, of third parties. So late 2000s, early 2010s, Google gets hit for about a half a billion dollars. It kind of has a ripple effect. These organizations you can see on the screen then start taking action against them. Uh, credit card processors require it for underwriting. Overall, this is how this is how people get it and why people get accredited today. And with that, I thank you. Thanks, Justin. Uh, great work, great presentation. I love the walk through the websites and the networks and uh, how you uh, and, and the challenges you have that are probably come to you on a minute by minute basis. Never mind on a daily basis. So thank you so much for that. And uh, just a quick reminder that. Uh, we have some questions in the Q&A box already, and uh, we look forward to seeing some more from the over 230 attendees to the webinar this uh, at, uh, today. So without further ado, we want to turn it over to Libby, and I see your uh, smiling face on the screen already. Thank you so much. Libby is a partner with Fagray Drinker Consulting and serves as a senior advisor to the Alliance for Safe Online Pharmacies, ASOP Global and ASOC Global Foundation. She helps shape public policy and promote increased international attention to the issue of illegal online pharmacies and counterfeit uh, substandard and falsified medicines in the US, the EU, and Asia. Libby's work at Fragrade Drinker is focused on internet pharmacies and pharmacy compliance, telemedicine and telehealth, pharmaceutical supply chain security and integrity, falsified and counterfeit medicines, mobile health, internet governance and ICANN policy, new generic top level domain policy, the US Food and Drug Administration regulatory and user fee reforms, and finally, the International Regulatory Harmonization and Capacity Building. Amazing list, Am amazing list. Anyways, Libby has traveled and led discussions on the support and issues throughout the world, and we're most fortunate to have her at the webinar today. And I've been very fortunate to work with Libby on many issues over the years, and her knowledge and value on this issue is immeasurable. Libby, over to you, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ron. I really appreciate it. I think I have control of the slides now, so we'll do that. Um, so I've seen some of the questions in the chat and I will address them in my presentation today. Uh, first, thank you for letting me be here and I appreciate being a part of this esteemed audience. I feel embarrassed not to be a pharmacist in this group, just a mere lawyer in Washington, DC. So please forgive me if I get a technical pharmacy term wrong, but I'm amongst good company here with you all. And I appreciate the chance to present to you today on this topic. I've seen questions about consumer trends. So I'll discuss that. Also questions about how do we enforce? What do we actually do to shut down these legal websites? Um, how do we protect patients in our jurisdiction? And I'll get to regulatory solutions. That long title that, that Ron just mentioned, the Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation Regulatory Harmonization Center has done some incredible work internationally to provide tips and tools for regulators. I'll get to that as well. So just uh, orienting, and you've heard this before, there's no medicine that can escape being counterfeited or being substandard and falsified medicine sold online. This is a global problem. Um, you'll see statistics that I may have been repeated throughout this early part of the discussion with links here. So please do take advantage of those hyperlinks and we'll put them in the chat as well. Um, buying medicine online has increased over the years. There was a question in the chat about this. Why are people buying online? Three major reasons, cost, 
convenience, access to care. Those trends have been true since I've been doing this work for about 15 years. We started studying this in 2008. We've been seeing trends year over year, cost, convenience, and access to care. And the COVID-19 pandemic has only exacerbated all of those drivers. I'll show you some statistics. Again, this is US statistics. Mike covered some of the European statistics that ASAP EU's done. Justin raised some global statistics as well. We have additional material from other jurisdictions on our website, which is buysaferx.pharmacy and asopfoundation.pharmacy. There's more research there. I'm gonna give you the big picture as we've been studying this issue from the US perspectives, as I mentioned since 2008, this trend line continues to go up. You'll see in 42% of Americans now are currently purchasing medicine online. Again, cost, convenience, and access to care. That's a 7% increase from 2020. That again, that trend line keeps going up. So you from 19% increase from FDA's own research back in 2013. Even Canadians, and I have ASOP Canada as a chapter of ours, and important jurisdictions for a number of reasons here in the United States, Americans are often looking for the cheap Canadian product. Unfortunately, the vast majority of online pharmacies labeling themselves as pharmacies are not, set, not actually licensed pharmacies, but they may be advertising, as, jo as Justin just showed you, medicines from other jurisdictions shipping into other countries. Canadians historically were more reluctant to buy medicine online, but you've seen a year over year 7% increase. And this is data that just came out last week, a 7% increase in Canadians increasingly interested in buying medicines online. Trends are going up again, cost, convenience, access to care. Here's, a, here's a, some additional examples. 36% of Americans surveyed in this most recent study from 2021, found that they were in, the pandemic increased their interest in buying online. Who's surprised by that? We were all stuck at home. We were worried about our children. We were fearful for our own health security. We didn't know exactly wh when we should be able, what the rules of the road were for engaging in civil society anymore. Our worlds were turned upside down. The way we accessed a lot of things, including each other in many virtual forums like this, was through the internet. And that, also, that increased Americans' interest in buying medicine online. You can see the increase here, 36%. First-time buyers, in, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, 49% of people started buying medicines online for the first time due to COVID-19 or just unrelated to COVID or for reasons unrelated to COVID-19. But a massive increase in the last two years because the pandemic has taught us that we can get everything we need online. Unfortunately, that is just not true. 64% of Americans plan to continue to buy medicine online when the pandemic ends. And I'm going to pause here to distinguish between legitimate online pharmacies and telemedicine, which we've seen booming in the pandemic. As a, as a law firm partner, I spend a lot of time setting up and regulating and helping compliance with legitimate pharmacies and legitimate telehealth companies and legitimate doctors that are just trying to do the right thing by using digital health technology to serve patients where they are located, at their home, at their office, at their schools. Digital health can be a really good positive force for access to care. Unfortunately, as Justin just showed, it's very, very easy to also set up a rogue online drug seller website or using social media to get access to people that are looking for care due to cost, convenience, and need for access. And so the distinction between legitimate telemedicine and online pharmacy, regulated licensed activity, and illegitimate online pharmacy or illegitimate drug sales through search and social and online marketplace is a really important distinction but this statistic shows you 64% of Americans, at least, plan to continue to go online and may not know the difference between that legitimate channel and the illegitimate legal activity that's going on that Mike and Justin just showed you. So what does this mean for us? Consumers don't understand the risks, that distinction that I just mentioned. Let me show you some statistics. We asked in a consumer survey in the United States, and this was also mirrored in, in Canada. I know Mike has done some important work in Europe as well. We wanna know, are people worried about buying things online? Do they realize that they may have received a substandard or falsified medicine or could have been harmed by a prescription drug product that they bought online? So we asked this question, yes, have you, are you aware of anybody that has received a substandard or falsified medicine? 7% said, yes, it's happened to me. That's an increase from 2020, 2021. 
It's happened to me or my friends. It's happened to someone I know in the community. I've read about it in the news. That's an important increase, just the importance of public awareness. Interpol and Europol and others reporting, FDA and your government authorities reporting on harms that are caused by illegal online drug sale is really important. So appreciate that 20% of people being aware of the problem just through news or through um, written reports. Unfortunately, 38% of people are familiar with someone themselves, their family members, their acquaintances have actually received a substandard or counterfeit problem from an online pharmacy. That's a 9% increase. I get asked this question all the time. Is this a real problem, Libby? Or is this a problem that, you're, that you see on the internet but people aren't actually being harmed? Is this a hypothetical public health threat or is it real? This statistic tells you it's real. 38% of people are receiving or have knowledge of someone receiving a substandard or counterfeit prescription drug from an illegal online drug seller. A 9% increase is a, is a leap for public health officials to be, be deeply concerned about the growth and trends lines of consumer behavior and the knowledge of people receiving counterfeit and substandard products online. It's a real threat. Why are people willing to do this? I see some questions in the chat about this. Why would people take this risk? So one in four percent, one in four Americans, again, say they'd accept this higher risk for that cost savings and convenience. Get a click of a button, prescription comes to my door. I don't have to worry about going to a pharmacy, having interactions, risking potential additional infection by standing in line. Um, so they just cost and convenience major drivers. 46% of Americans say they'd be willing to purchase it from sites either unsanctioned, knowingly unsanctioned by the US FDA or their state board of pharmacy, if it increases their access, decreases their cost or provides more access to care. Again, those three big drivers, people are willing to accept the risk. This is hard for us to accept as public health professionals. We spend a lot of time securing the safety of our medicine. You're licensed and trained and disciplined in medication safety, your whole job is to protect people. And then you see a statistic like this, that nearly half of Americans are willing to, to bypass all those safety checks to get something cheaper and easier. I also don't think it should be that big of a surprise given what we've just experienced in the pandemic and what we know about consumer behavior generally. So what can we do about it? I will, do think, as Justin described, how important it is to steer people to safe sources of medicine. This gives you a this gives you a little insight into consumer behavior. Forty five percent of Americans believe that all websites offering healthcare services have been approved somewhere. We just want to trust, and we, I mean, in this context, Americans want to trust the internet. This our data bears this out. Even no, in the face of knowing there's massive fraud and criminal activity online. 45% of Americans still believe that anything offering healthcare information has been approved by a regulator. The misconception is even higher, 59% of those that have already purchased medicine online. So if you're a buyer and you're bought into the idea that you can get prescription drugs online, you are inclined to believe it's safe. Almost 60% of Americans think that that's a safe channel. That is a dangerous fact. 72% of Americans think that they can, that these results, that their search results that Justin just showed, they should be verified. Safe websites should come to the top of search. We can trust the internet for a lot of things. If I ask, what's the capital of, Boga of Columbia, I will get the right answer. If I asked, what's the weather in Washington, DC today, Google will probably give me the right answer. Unfortunately, when it comes to search engines and social media companies and online marketplaces, when I search for prescription medicine, I don't always get the safe stuff. 72% of Americans at least believe that they, sh they should be getting the safe um, licensed search result or verified websites in the top of search results. Unfortunately, that's just not happening. So I'm gonna turn from what's happening in consumers experience. Why are consumers doing this? Cost, convenience, access to care. What are the trends? It's going up um, to what can we do about it? What can we do to, to provide regulatory enforcement? I don't, I don't want to um, bury you in detail on this slide. This just gives you a visual image of what Justin and Mike described. It's a global problem. Things are happening in multiple jurisdictions. The internet infrastructure that Justin described, the payment processing, the merchant bank accounts, the internet, um, the internet um, architecture itself, where the criminals located, where the drugs are shipping from, all those are happening in many jurisdictions. 
Justin rightly pointed, criminals don't usually um, act, have activity in their own jurisdiction, in their home state or in their home country. They don't wanna get caught by the coppers there. They will rather ship out and I use infrastructure from other jurisdictions, making it a very complicated international enforcement problem. So what can we do? Um, you'll see this slide gives you a sense of, of what's going on. I won't, I won't belabor this. Many of you probably know this for your own country and the APEC toolkit that I'm gonna turn to talks about them, these very issues. The questions about do uh, over the counter medicines, are they sold online? What are the rules of the road for prescription medicines sold online? And some of these rules have been changed or waived during the pandemic to increase access to care during the, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm gonna talk about this internet toolkit. This answers a lot of the international questions that the audience has been asking about what can we do. The, inter the toolkit is, um, is designed by the Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation. ASAP Global, along with Health Canada, have been steering this internet sales working group for a number of years now and have developed a toolkit as part of the roadmap for supply chain security. This gives you some information about what the toolkit is, and I'm going to go into some detail. It is available, and I'll make sure to put a hyperlink as well. So the toolkit makes recommendations to what you can do to, um, to combat illegal online drug sales, provides education and resources, and provides definition of key terms. Here's some recommendations. I won't read them all to you, but, but critically it's important. And, and this work, let me just back up, was done with a committee. So it's not just ASOP and Health Canada. I know Linda Scammell's on this call. So Linda's very involved in this. Mike has been involved, Mike Isles from ASAP EU. NABP has been involved in this work over the years to develop a global regulatory toolkit for, um, for regulators and law enforcement to think about how to protect their citizens in their jurisdiction. First thing is important is that education is a really valuable tool. And so you'll see the number one recommendation from the toolkit is bringing public awareness campaigns to, to your jurisdiction, to patients where they are located and critically to healthcare professionals. You saw those statistics that, that Mike and Justin offered about pharmacists don't even know how to distinguish a safe, legitimate online pharmacy from an illegal online drug seller just teaching the pharmacy community about how to look for indications of, of legitimacy and looking to the right of the dot for safe dot pharmacy is really important. So public awareness generally is, is um, a tool. I will give a plug to say the Alliance for Safe Online Pharmacies has free materials for education translated in a couple different languages, probably not all of, all of the ones that are needed here today, but there is material on buysaferx.pharmacy that you can download and use, no permissions required, also at safe.pharmacy and ABP's website, please use those materials, spread them widely. They're provided for the public to educate the public and healthcare providers about these issues. So that's recommendation one. Strengthening laws, I'll talk a little bit more about that. The distinction between legal and illegal actors, very important. Um, I'll talk about model voluntary protocols briefly and a couple of these other um, tips and tools. So strengthening laws. Um, I, I saw a couple of uh, comments in the chat, or maybe it was privately to me, saying our laws don't recognize um, the distinction between online drug sales and brick and mortar drug sales, or we don't have definitions about internet pharmacy. What should we do about that? First step is to know your laws. Um, and I'll go back to this. Know your laws. So um, I, we started this in 2009 by surveying the laws here in the United States and a couple other jurisdictions, trying to understand what are the rules of the road that, are I, that I have control over? If you're a regulator, you're a pharmacist, what is in my law and what's not? If you're not a lawyer, I know some, uh, but if you, if you need some help in your jurisdiction, I'm sure FIP and others here in this community might be able to help steer you to those sources. Importantly, strengthening laws. M Mike mentioned the Medicrimes Convention. There's lots of other resources on our website that I could talk about how to strengthen laws to protect from substandard and falsified products online. But important is to have the rules defined. Second is to then think about what else can we do? So even if we know what is legal and illegal in our jurisdiction for buying medicine online, what can we do to stop the problem? And I'll go into that here. So as, as I mentioned, I think of the internet in three buckets, search engines, social media companies, and online marketplaces. The solutions for those are all different. Here's some examples. This is, the, this is a very US-centric perspective. Um, Mike, I know, has been involved in a lot of work in Europe on these topics. Canada is mirroring some of this activity as well. I imagine some of your countries are also thinking about solutions to, I'll call it bad stuff or illegal activity online. But first, um, search engines, 
social media companies, and online marketplaces. Different types of problems, all web-based, different types of platforms that can create public health risk if not properly regulated and steering patients to safe sources. So strategy one, and you heard Mike and Justin talk a little bit about this, is hold domain name registries and registrars accountable. I could go into a lot of detail, but NABP is gonna put out a better report. So I'm gonna encourage you to read that report that Justin just mentioned about locking and suspending domain names. Those are the, that's the URL and the email addresses associated with website accounts like buysaferx.pharmacy. That's a domain name. If domain names can be used for illegal activity as Justin just described. Our concern is that we need to have rules of the road in each country to make sure that people, regulators, especially health regulators, have the ability to stop those, um, those domain names that are being used to sell drugs illegally to their citizens. So that's one. Number two, require social media companies to report illegal activity. You saw some of those examples from Justin, social media companies massive increase in social media in the past couple of years. I'm sure you know as well as I do how active the youth are, especially in social media. We've seen um, we've seen a really dangerous uptake or uptick in online sales of counterfeit products laced with fentanyl and other controlled substances being sold through social media channels. You know, fentanyl poisoning is real. We have patients in almost every state and families in almost every state in the United States that have had children die from buying pills laced with fentanyl, uh, died by fentanyl poisoning in the United States. Um, I, those products have typically been, been offered through social media channels. Um, there's a lot of research that has gone into how to, how to detect those types of illegal activities. But what do we do about it? If we know it's happening on social media, what can we do to stop it? Especially as a public health official or a regulator in your country. The, the trend legally and in policy is to require social media companies to start reporting. It's not enough just to be a platform and offer a social media or a marketplace or a common platform for communication. There's also now encouraged um, legislation and lobbying activity to require social media companies to do more to police their own platforms to stop illegal online drug sales. So that's part two. What can you do is be an advocate for requiring social media companies to report illegal activity. Communicate with us here at ASAP Global, ASAP EU, ASAP Canada, or NABP, or FIP to talk about the importance of social media company accountability to public health service. It's a place that people go for healthcare information. We need more accountability around those places. And number three, online marketplaces. That's like Alibaba and eBay, Amazon, requiring transparency for sellers in those marketplaces. It's easy to offer something in an, in an, in an eBay-like format, but it's very hard sometimes to know who's behind those sales. So there's legislation both in the United States and internationally to require more transparency in online marketplaces. So you know who you're buying from when you're buying something like a prescription drug. At a minimum, you should be able to know who you're buying from. So that is, um, those are the three solutions that, that we've been working on internationally and domestically here in the United States. And I can talk more about them in, in question and answer. Finally, uh, very important and going back to what Justin was just describing, distinguishing safe legal websites that are doing regulated business in healthcare to those that are operating illegally. We have a couple tools for that and you just saw Justin talk about this as well. US FDA came out with a campaign, Be Safe Rx. So know your online pharmacy information, verify before you buy. That's a new campaign that's gonna be coming out here in the United States at least. We hope it goes viral. We hope everybody uses it internationally with some celebrities here. So watch for more um, with celebrities from Hollywood talking about the importance of verifying your source before you buy. That's true in every jurisdiction, verify before you buy. So um, this is a website by the US FDA and there'll be another campaign coming out soon. So stay tuned for that information. I'm gonna turn to, if I can get to the next slide, there you go. Um, finally, I just wanna make sure that people know you can also, um, I don't think it's going to turn. You can also look to safe.pharmacy. Um, and there you go. Here's some additional information um, about how to find additional information about the threats of substandard falsified medicine. More information at NABP's website. I know we don't have too much time, so I'll, con I'll continue to make sure that you see. Here's other ways to buy safe and distinguish safe legal online pharmacies from illegitimate actors that endanger public health and safety. More information here at buysaferx.pharmacy. And I think with that, I'm going to conclude because I know I'm just about out of time and I wanna leave time for questions and answers. So I will leave the um, information in the chat and leave you with that. Thank you, Ron.
Thank you so much, uh, Libby. Great information. Uh, and it's good to see that there's a lot of international activity um, based out of maybe North America, but also internationally uh, with regards to uh, combating this, this, this great global problem and trying to keep our patients, uh, patients safe. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we will move to the question and answer uh, session. And um, we have some listed already. And uh, what we wanna do is move to them, but I'm gonna go with the very first question that we received and challenge our uh, speakers. And the question is, how do you monitor and close down such websites that are legally advertised in such medicines, especially in low and middle, middle income countries? And Libby talked uh, at length about how to sh uh, shut it down, but how can uh, we, I guess, push perhaps maybe some of the solutions because uh, having the countries ask for that assistance, I know we're always front and center to try to help as much as we possibly can, but how do we raise that level of awareness and, and uh, tackle this issue in those countries? And also, if you can uh, include in your answer, how do, you, how do we raise that public awareness? Because we can raise the awareness with policymakers, we can raise the awareness with the professionals, it's the public is a challenge. So. Because Libby was last to speak, we're gonna let her to go first to speak and give her her thoughts on that and we'll have others join in as well. Thank you. That's a great question. I'll raise two points, answering the consumer awareness question first. Uh, it's free and easy to use social media to raise awareness. FIP, there's a com there's Fight the Fakes, ASAP Global, ASAP EU. We all put out content to NAVP that you can just retweet and share to just try to elevate I'll say we can make this issue go viral just by using this community of pharmacy leaders talking about the issue of buying from safe sources. If we all just did that, talking about this issue, our networks are so large and you pro your respect in your countries is probably so great, you could make a major impact of just raising awareness through that, that activity alone. Um, point number two is, so how do we get, what do we do in those um, middle or low income countries to monitor and shut down? This is a challenge. I would encourage people to work internationally with other parties. One country can't do this alone. You saw that slide that shows about how we have to work internationally. Um, I, I would The first step I would do is know who your regulator is in your country. So if you have a pharmacy regulator in your country or a medicines regulator, we have the USFDA, of course, get to know that regulator. You can do something as simple if you're just an individual pharmacist is write a letter saying, I'm concerned about regulation of internet drug sales. That's a very simple civil act. Uh, the other things you can certainly do are getting more involved in local pharmacy society and engaging with re the regulator community about how we need to educate um, on this issue, both from the regulator perspective and, and individually. Monitoring is tricky. I don't think any individual pharmacist or any individual is going to be doing that type of monitoring that NABP does. And so maybe I'll turn it to Justin to talk about the monitoring activity that NABP does and how important it is to be collaborative with, with local government. Yes. Yeah, so, Justice. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I would say, you know, the, the important thing um, from a monitoring perspective is really to access websites as a consumer would. Um, you wouldn't think that. You'd think that the right answer is to use some super high tech, you know, way of going about it. But and, and sometimes that is the right answer. We do that. We do do some, you know, pretty decent cyber sleuthing on that end. But I think the most important part to kind of start that process is to arm law enforcement with, hey, this is what people in your jurisdiction are seeing. This is what you can, they can actually go and purchase. This is how I found it. This is the access information. And, and that really paints a really clear picture. We have great working relationships in the US, with both federal and obviously state law enforcement and, and organizations that regulate these activities. And, and realistically, the opening kind of uh, salvo for those conversations have always been, hey, can we talk about the internet? Let's pull up a, a search engine and start there. Um, and demonstrating that it's it's super accessible. And as far as how you monitor that going, then yeah, I think that's robust infrastructure and, and things like that. But and that that's a question of you know how you make that uh, sustainable over the long run. But generally speaking, getting people interested is the, the most important part when liaisoning with local regulators. And it might be kind of an antiquated solution, but I'm I guess an antiquated guy. As much as this is an internet online type of challenge. There's some print materials that community pharmacies can make available to their patients and hand out that information and say, hey, do you know that this is an issue? And as much as we're talking face to face, they're always talking to their colleagues and other uh, patients. And sometimes those printed materials 
examples are valuable as well. Our time is getting tight. I just want to direct one question to Mike. Could you just do a bit of a recap? We're having a challenge uh, with some of the, in the chat areas, and, and the point's very well made about some of the terms we're using when we say counterfeit versus, versus uh, falsified or, or substandard medications. Do we mean the same thing? And the other thing, just to clarify, we talk about illegal pharmacies, but when we say illegal pharmacies, what are we really talking about? Because they're really not pharmacies. Yes, there was a, a long, a long debate um, about what the definition should be. I think with the European Union coming out with the falsified medicines directive, the, the term falsified is becoming much more common, falsified substandard. Counterfeit tends to be used more in the intellectual property area. And to the layperson, fake pharmaceuticals, I think, really resonates um, very strongly. Um, in terms of um, the term pharmacy, yes, as Linda pointed out in the in the chat, um, if if a website is uh, purported to look like a pharmacy, it doesn't mean and it isn't a pharmacy, and therefore I think the term uh, ph ph a fake pharmacy is relevant, but of course it, it is not. It, it is a website that is selling medicines illegally. Thank you so much. And I'm just looking at the clock on the wall and uh, we will have to start wrapping up. So uh, there are some questions I in the question and answer, and I believe in the presentations, we covered most of the answers, <clears throat> excuse me, to those questions. So I'm just going to uh, move over to the wrap up session and um, as we're getting close to the, the stop time, and it would be absolutely impossible to do a, a recap on all the things that uh, we've heard this uh, in this webinar. Um, but this does issue put million, puts millions and millions of patients at risk. And some of the issues that are some of the solutions we've talked about today are certainly available and accessible uh, through FIP and through the organizations that are presented here, ASOP Global, ASOP EU and NABP. So please, if you need some assistance, reach out to any one of those organizations and that assistance will be there for you front and center. Um, one of the things I want to add in the recap is I forgot to thank the excellent uh, support staff at FIP for getting us online and get us uh, look so bright and intelligent uh, in Canada it this very early morning. Uh, great support work and thank you for setting all that up for us. Uh, we do have a few more announcements before uh, we close, but I think it's important to keep the conversations alive. And I think that's what Libby's talked about and Justin and, and, uh, and Mike as well, is keep the conversation alive because sometimes we don't think about this being as big as issue as, as it is. And it's a huge issue. And the impact on our patients and the impact on patient safety is absolutely phenomenal. I wanna add a brief comment about uh, the regulators forum out of FIP. And the regulators forum is a global fat platform for the professional pharmacy professional regulators to share information, emerging trends, and the need for regulations. And Louis talked about the need for regulations, and there is an opportunity through the FIP forum, uh, regulators forum, to share that information and also uh, gather information. I know FIP is going to be doing some work on regulations and, and uh, uh, model regulations. So please take an opportunity to look at the regulations forum. In the chat line, we'll have a, a, a link that you can go to because the regulators forum is an opportunity to access that additional information to work together collaboratively, not only within your country, but internationally with all the countries that have done some excellent work on this issue. And uh, you can then not have to recreate things, but in fact, maybe just use documents that are already there and uh, with some translation to your respective country and uh, meet the needs of that patient safety on this very, very devastating issue. Uh, before we sign off on the webinar, I just want to advise you of the FIP Congress coming up. FIP uh, is excited to invite you to the 80th FIP World Congress of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sci Sciences in Seville, Spain. Uh, the Congress, Congress story is happening from September 18th to the 22nd in Seville, and it's under the title of Pharmacy United in Recovering Health Care. This is a face-to-face -face Congress. It's the first time it's happened in a couple of years due to uh, the pandemic. And we are quite excited to have the Congress proceed. Registration and the abstract submissions are already open if you wish to submit. And for more information, you can see on, the, uh, on your screens, 
how to log in to the section of the FIP website to get more information and get your uh, registration in. And my gosh, early bird registration ends in a few days. So you wanna get uh, clicking right away after we sign off uh, from this webinar. So we also have the opportunity to bring your attention to uh, the resources at the FIP website. And as we said, stated at the out, outset of the webinar today, there is an immense amount of information through the uh, FIP website on global pharmacy collaboration, on pharmacy practice, uh, regulatory issues, and you will have the link in the chat to get to the regulators forum. You only need to go to the FIP website to discover the amount of assistance that is waiting there for you to help. And the question about um, lower income countries, that help is there for your asking for sure. You might consider then uh, joining FIP and then you can access all areas of the website. You can follow up also with all of the presenters as you've uh, seen them at the webinar who would also help you along the way. And if you're worried about missing any future live events or webinar events, just type uh, FIP, or sorry, events.fip.org into your browser and you can see the list of events and participate as they come forward. So we're almost right on the button. Thank you for attending. I wish you all the very best on the rest of your week. Thank you again so much for our presenters. Very informative. Um, I learn every time I hear them speak. And also thank you so much for the FIP staff to get us uh, on cue uh, to have this presentation done. And please, you know, we don't often recognize the good work that the individuals do. So you do excellent work out there. Keep up your good work. Keep the patients safe and keep them receiving that quality of care from the pharmacist and the pharmacy profession. Bye for now. All the very best. Enjoy the rest.